Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tim Bird. I'm a principal software engineer at Sony Electronics, and uh, welcome to this session of um, Embedded Linux Conference. I'm going to be talking about issues with open source license compliance in consumer electronics. So I usually like to put the abstract inside the slides in case people come along uh, afterwards, but uh, you can see that online. And um, this is the agenda that I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to go through a little bit of the legal disclaimer. Uh, it's important for a talk like this. I'll talk about aspects of compliance and give a little bit of the license history, uh, talk about some of the gotchas that you may encounter as you're dealing with compliance, and then give some of my own personal recommendations. So let's start with this disclaimer. So uh, first, it's important to recognize that the law is way different than code. Um, and there's a lot of armchair lawyers uh, out in open source. Um, but it's important to remember, well, so one, I'm a software developer, I'm not a lawyer, uh, and I'm specifically not your lawyer. So uh, there are a lot of unexpected things in law that unless you have legal experience, uh, you're not gonna know about. Uh, so don't trust what you read on the internet um, or even what you hear from me. Uh, people will make strong statements about what's required by licenses, but it's just their opinion. The same, same goes for this presentation. Uh, there are actually very few legal court decisions that have been made about GPL. And uh, the language of the GPL in a couple of places, it's a little bit ambiguous. And uh, some, I don't know of any open source license that, in choose, that includes a choice of law, which means that um, the, it might be interpreted differently in different uh, legal venues. So, and I know for a fact that German law, uh, in terms of licenses and contracts, is uh, is a little bit different than U.S. law, and so there's unexpected things that can occur in different jurisdictions. So you should always check with your own company legal counsel when you're making uh, decisions that you think might have some legal risk. And it's really important for me to let you know, these are my views. I am not speaking on behalf of Sony Corporation, uh, even though I've got the logo on my slides. Uh, the, these are my viewpoints, and uh, so let me get started. Uh, part of the reason for this talk is because I do have some pet peeves. Uh, I've, I've been uh, doing Linux for over 25 years now, and I hear this a lot on forums and stuff. Uh, it's trivial to comply with the license. Just post the source code. You know, what, what's the big deal? Well, it's actually not as trivial as it sounds. So that works when you have an in-house product and you're in con complete control of all the source top to bottom. Uh, and that's true for some products. Uh, but there's a lot of other products where you're getting components from other places and uh, it just doesn't, uh, in, in particular with large products like a mobile phone, uh, I think the last time we, uh, th there's one product at Sony uh, that I measured the code on. We had 58 million lines of code that came from multiple vendors. In, in case of a mobile phone, you're talking about code from Google, uh, MediaTek or Qualcomm and Sony. And there are a bunch of others in the supply chain providing software for drivers and and sometimes black box components that go inside the product. Uh, so it's not, it's not as simple as uh, having all of the code just in-house. Uh, and there are some business units that, that do black box or what we call white label products. I'm aware of some old security cameras that were just relabeled by the vendor uh, and they'd come from a completely separate vendor. Um, and some business units are, are not in the software business per se. So Sony B2B uh, is a business unit that does uh, uh, IP and AV suites for stadium, uh, stadium uh, packages for stadium suites. And so uh, they are, do not have the same level of expertise as like system level developers uh, inside some of the other Sony product teams. So it's, it's much more complicated than, than people kind of assert. But having said that, let's talk about what is required. So uh, these are the aspects of license uh, uh, compliance. Uh, you have to know what's in your product. I'm going to talk about what types of things you have to provide and some of the requirements around those. So let's get into that. The first thing, and this is really important, is you got to know what's in your product. Um, if you're dealing with a large product, uh, by large I mean lots of lines of code, lots of components, uh, then you can expect to maintain a spreadsheet possibly with thousands of lines of rows. And most people will look at uh, a package, this, the list of packages on a website, and say, well, there's not that many packages. It's like, well, but there are that many files, and the license granularity is not necessarily at the granularity of the, of the package. So uh, you have to know what's inside your, your um, product. There are tools to assist with this, both commercial and 
open source uh, and you can go look at those. There's lots of resources to find out about those and, and how to use those. Um, I have found in my experience that uh, most often the problem comes from suppliers. So there are some suppliers out there who do not take their responsibility seriously. And uh, there's a working group in the Linux Foundation uh, called Open Chain, and they focus on education and certification. So um, there's a standard and it's actually an ISO standard. Uh, it's either, it's already been approved or it's on track to be approved, but for open source processes within a company. And, and this is really important because as products become more complex, uh, you're getting uh, software and hardware from more and more suppliers. And all it takes is one supplier to kind of screw it up uh, in, in your supply chain. And so um, we're, at, as Sony, we're a platinum member of Open Chain. We're uh, very interested in seeing that this education and these processes and methods uh, that improve open source compliance are, are used throughout the industry. I think it helps not just us, but it helps helps the entire industry. Um, so the first thing is you got to know what's in your product. Uh, for it, in order to do this, it's very helpful if you can actually build uh, what you get from your supplier. So that is interesting. Sometimes the software is embedded, um, and so deeply embedded, and and so it's not. You can't do this 100% of the time, but it's uh, useful if you can validate the source that's provided to you and that that matches the binaries on your component. Um, so some of the, one of the things that you have to do is you have to provide what we call attribution. Uh, and most licenses, even, even permissive ones uh, like MIT or BSD, require that you give someone notice uh, about the presence of that software and the, possibly the copyright or the authors somewhere in the product text. And some, some licenses require this uh, to only accompany the source uh, and others require that it accompany the product. Um, uh, what most, well, and so it used to be that we just put stuff on a paper manual, uh, but as we've been used more and more open source, it's gotten way too long for that. So um, here's some of the requirements uh, for different licenses. Uh, different licenses like MIT or BSD require stuff either to accompany the source, or they require that it accompany the, the binaries, which means the product. Um, BSD4 actually required that you give notice in the advertising materials. Uh, that is a super obnoxious clause that um, the, actually the whole industry kind of worked hard to eliminate that. I don't think you'll find much BSD4 uh, licensed software out there, but that's an example of, you know, there's a big variety of places where this, uh, these requirements uh, required you to put places put things. Um, and so in order to simplify things, most companies uh, will just gather everything, uh, the licenses, the attributions, the copyrights, the licenses, and they'll put it on a single page in the device. Um, and that's accessible by a menu item. And so if you look on your own phone, uh, an Xperia, I have an Xperia phone here. So um, if you look under about and legal information on your phone, you'll see this huge long screen. Uh, in fact, the the scroll bar, I think, is only one pixel big. It's or two pixels. It's it's hard actually to get to the scroll bar. But and um, but you have all this information. It's included with the product. Now, so what happens if you have a product that has no display? And there are some products that have no paper docs either. And there are even some products <laughs> that have no display, no paper docs, and no packaging. Um, so what people do, and I'm not. Uh, I'm not going to make any judgment about whether this is sufficient or not, but what people I have seen people do is they put a web link either on the product packaging, if it has packaging, or if there's no product packaging, I've heard of people inscribing a web link on the product itself. So I think in that case, that's about as well as you can do. Uh, and then of course, at that link, whatever the website is, you have to keep that website up and you have to have the information, uh, all the relevant information there. The other thing that you have to provide is you have to uh, provide source code or an offer for source. Uh, so the GPL gives two options for this. So let's let's talk about those two options. So uh, one of the things you can do is provide the actual source code with the product itself. So the GPL says accompany it with the complete corresponding machine readable source code uh, on a medium customarily used for software interchange. So some of your options here, you could include physical media like a USB stick or a CD-ROM. And I've actually seen examples of this and, and those are fine. Some, some products, uh, you can actually put it on the internal storage in the product itself. And uh, this is an interesting option. It does solve some issues. 
uh, it, it makes certain other things easier. So you don't have to create a download site. You don't have to keep it populated for a period of time. Uh, you don't have to do physical fulfillment after the fact. You, once you've done it in the product, you don't have to, you don't have to uh, keep doing it in the, in the future. And you don't have to give the software to anyone who asks for it. You only have to give it to your product recipients. It's kind of baked into your product delivery. The reason that this is not used very often, there's a couple of reasons. One, uh, there are products that uh, don't have sufficient internal storage, right? We are talking about embedded products here, deeply embedded. Uh, but even, even then, if you're going to do firmware updates, uh, you're going to do those over the air. You can't be shipping a USB stick or a new CD-ROM with every firmware update. Uh, so there are size issues, uh, even if you wanted to kind of include the source with the CVD update. So uh, ultimate. Ultimately, this is a solution that is not used very often in the industry. So the other solution is to provide an offer for source. Instead of the source itself, you provide an offer. And uh, the wording of the GPL here is, accompany it with a written offer valid for at least three years to give any third party for a charge no more than your cost of physically performing source revision, a complete machine readable copy of the corresponding source code on a medium customarily used for software interchange. And that last part is kind of key. So most community members um, feel like an internet download site is sufficient. Uh, however, uh, I've talked to a fair number of lawyers and most lawyers believe that this should be interpreted, that language should be interpreted as the medium used for software interchange in 1999 when the license was written. So offering only on the internet is not sufficient. Um, so an offer of a CD or something, maybe a mag tape, I don't know, that'd be rude. Uh, is is required. And then I want to take a little segue here. Um, so it, it, but it varies. So different uh, venues may interpret this differently. Um, so the, I already said the licenses don't include a choice of law. So something that uh, may be made a decision in one country may not apply in another country. But if you're dealing with a large multinational corporation, which I am with Sony, uh, you have to look at all the different countries. Um, the license can be interpreted in different countries. Actually, in Germany, there is case law. There was a court case uh, that said you must provide the option to obtain physical media. Um, so there's a legal precedent there. And German courts have taken the GPL seriously, including uh, details about the source offer. So you, you have to be careful. Uh, I just want to take just a tiny bit of a segue here or, or a detour. Uh, certain effects of, or features of German law were used by one litigant. Uh, to gain a lot of money with a particular legal strategy. Uh, so, um, and I'm not gonna go into the details of that. Uh, I have a resource page at the end of these slides that has information about that case. It was, the litigant was, uh, his name was Patrick McCarty. And uh, the bottom line there is uh, don't sign any consent agreements or compliance agreements in Germany without consulting a lawyer and reading up on the strategy there. Um, the, anyway, I'll just leave it at that. Um, so there are places uh, where you need to be careful uh, with your interpretation and your fulfillment of, of the license requirements. And then even within a, a single country, you can have uh, different contributors to a project who interpret uh, the license differently. So, um, so it's, it's, it's not as clear cut, you know, fulfilling all the requirements is not as clear cut as, as a lot of people say. Um, in terms of duration, so how long do you have to offer the source code? Well, uh, it's not three, so you have to offer it from three years for the last shipment of the binary. So you're distributing a binary to someone and it's three years from, from that date. Um, but that's not the last shipment of the product. If you do over there updates, you're going to be providing updated firmware uh, and that's going to um, be another distribution of the binary. And it, and it doesn't mean three years from the date that you last put the firmware on your website. It's three years from the last from the time someone last downloaded the firmware. So the firmware could be up there a really long time, even after the lifetime of the product. Uh, you have to keep providing software uh, so that people could obtain it within three years after. So this is usually, however, uh, after having said all that, it's usually not a big problem. Uh, there's virtually no incentive for companies to take software off their sites and stuff just hangs around a long time. So technically you could be removing stuff, uh, but most people don't do it. So the duration is not that big of a deal. And then I'll just make one observation. Uh, if someone is asking you for physical media, uh, they are most likely a person who has more interest in uh, your compliance uh, and how you're doing with that than they do with the source. Because if your source is out on the internet site, that's easier for people to obtain. So I just a red flag, handle requests for source 
uh, promptly and carefully. Um, so now uh, to the source itself, what must the source include? So for um, the, the GPL license, which is the main license that requires uh, people to distribute source, says for an executable work, complete source code means all of the source code for all modules it contains, plus any associated interface definition files, plus the scripts used to control compilation and installation of the executable. So there's a term used elsewhere in the license, and by most lawyers, there's an acronym that's used, complete and corresponding source code, or CCS, you'll hear that for short. Um, so. Uh, the GPL also says the source code for work means the preferred form of the work for making modifications for it. So that means you cannot deliver obfuscated code. Uh, and it, it needs to be something that actually can be worked with by a human uh, in terms of modifying it and rebuilding it. Uh, and it's unfortunate, but I actually have seen examples of a supplier providing obfuscated code. I'm not going to name names because they they came clean and, and, uh, and provided... Uh, unobfuscated code later. So uh, we're, we treat that as an anomaly, um, but you, you should not do it. It should be something that some, a, a developer can actually use. Now about rebuilding. So you, does the definition of CCS require that a recipient can reproduce binaries exactly? And I would argue no. Uh, so it's very difficult to re reproduce a binary in exact form. In fact, there's a whole, there's a whole um, it, not industry, but there's a whole uh, movement to try to do reproduce builds. And this has been a sore subject for decades. So I think that's too high of a bar to require of, uh, of a vendor. Um, does, it, does the uh, definition of CCS require distribution of compilers, linkers, IDEs, or proprietary tools? No, it, it does not. You don't have to provide the compiler. Uh, you don't have to provide the, any proprietary tools. It does raise an interesting question, in, in my opinion, and I'm, I'm not going to talk about this a lot, but is it compliant to use proprietary tools to build open source software? So can I use a, a, a uh, commercial tool chain? Yes, you can. You can use a commercial tool chain. Uh, but you can keep doing this thought experiment for longer and say, well, is it compliant to use tools that are unavailable to the public? Can I make my own tool and use that? I'm, I'm not even going to get into that. I, I don't know. I, it's never been tested to my knowledge and, uh, and people don't actually even talk about it. But uh, having said all that, my view is that what is required is the scripts used to control compilation and installation. And this means auto tools, configure scripts, config files, and makes files. And that's sufficient for most packages. Um, now, another issue that comes up sometimes is reinstalling. Uh, because the license requires scripts used to control dot, dot, dot installation. Okay, it has that phrase in it. Some people interpret that to mean that uh, you need to be able to install the software on a particular device. So the license does not actually say that. Uh, it doesn't mention the act of installation or the target of installation. It just says the script uh, used for installation. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. So um, industry practice, uh, in fact, fully supports the use of GPL software in uh, read-only memory or ROM. So you can put GPL software in a ROM where it cannot be uh, reinstalled in place uh, on the same device that it was delivered on. Uh, and that's been a practice that's been supported and, and uh, there are even uh, quotes uh, about GPL reinstallation not applying in that case. So uh, I don't think the license requires reinstalling. Um, so if you go back and look at the license history, uh, it's pretty interesting. So BSD licenses kind of came into uh, effect around 1988. Uh, GPL, uh, actually v version one came out in 89 and it was a generalization of the Emacs license that Richard Stallman had been applying to some of the software in the GNU um, suite or the GNU project. And there, it, the history is pretty interesting. Uh, GPL v2 was released in 91 and it was adopted by Linus Torvalds. And then uh, GPL v3, uh, there were some perceived flaws in, in GPL v2 and Richard Stallman and others uh, worked on a new release of GPL that came out in 2007. There was a long discussion period on that, several years. Uh, and for very, a variety of reasons, uh, including uh, not really agreeing with uh, some of the intent behind the license, uh, GPL v3 was not ever adopted by the Linux kernel. Uh, and so 
uh, I want to talk here about interpreting the license. Uh, I think it's important because uh, at this point, people will start talking about, uh, well, what is, the, what is the intent of the license? And first, uh, the overriding legal principle is that the intent only matters if the license is unclear. So a license does not have its own intent. It is not a sentient being. Uh, a license is an expression of the intent of the copyright owners of the software. And it's not, it, it may reflect the intent of the author of the license, uh, but that's not the person who is making the agreement. Uh, it's the copyright owners of the software who are making the agreement. So the problem comes up with Linux and with other projects that have multiple authors as well. Who, who, whose intent matters? Um, is it the leaders of the project? Is it anyone? Uh, the Linux kernel now has about 14,000 uh, contributors. So uh, I'm sure that there's probably a bell curve of uh, different intents uh, for how the license should be interpreted. Um, and, uh, but I will, I will say this. So Linus Torvald's intent for the kernel is very clear. Uh, he has said on numerous times that the intent is tit for tat. And that expression means that I give you something, you give me the same thing back. So if I give you source code, you give me source code back. And again, that's been, uh, Linus has said that a number of times in a number of different venues. And I think that's, uh, so I believe that that is his intent. I, I've seen other leading kernel developers agree with that interpretation. So what are the license requirements? And again, this is my view. I'm not speaking on behalf of Sony Corporation, but my view is you give people the source, all of the source, including the make files, configure scripts, config files. Customers should be able to build the software, uh, but there's no requirement to exactly reproduce what you've built. And uh, there's no requirement to reinstall on a particular device. So if we have, if, uh, if a vendor has made fixes to bash, and uh, you think those fixes are good, you can uh, apply them to your version of Bash and use it on your desktop or anywhere else. Uh, if we've uh, put a driver in for, for a chipset or a, a feature on a chip, uh, and then you can take that feature and use it on a phone of your own making. So vendors are not required, in my opinion, to produce hardware that can run binaries uh, uh, that are produced by third parties. So. Bottom line, I believe secure product lockdown is allowed by GPLv2. And I don't think I'm alone in, in that requirement, interpretation of the requirement. Um, so GPLv2, uh, GPLv3 came about because of, uh, because of that uh, interpretation, I believe. So uh, if you look at GPLv3, really the requirements there are sought to impede lockdown and change the terms. Um, and GPL v3 does actually require keys to install the software on certain products. And most CE vendors, including Sony, strongly avoid GPL v3 uh, for this reason. So there are a couple of different views about that. One is that the GPL v2 had that intent all along and, and the changes in GPL v3 are just changing the wording to, to strengthen that. Uh, but another view is, well, if the GPL view, if GPL v2 in, incorporated that requirement, you wouldn't need to change the wording. So the GPL v3 is a different license. And there are some people, uh, very clearly some people who have been vocal that that was not their intent to disallow lockdown. So um, take that for what it's worth. And the final thing here is that many projects adopted uh, the Linux kernel and GPL uh, software based on the wording of GPL v2 and not of GPL v3. So you can't hold them. I don't think it's fair to hold them uh, to, to the standard of GPL v3 or to the requirements of GPL v3. And even R Richard Stallman has uh, said it's evil to change the terms of the deal and expect people to uh, abide by a different license than what they agreed to. Uh, so now I want to talk a little bit about gotchas. Uh, there are some nuances uh, that can come in and bite you. Um, so what happens is languages change over time and projects change over time. And th these are two sources of things that you really have to watch out for. So uh, MPL stands for Mozilla Public License. And over time, it changed its wording slightly. And so as a, a vendor, if you're using MPL software, you need to pay attention to uh, the version that's on the, uh, the, the license that's on the version of the code that you're using the version of the license on the version of the code you're using. MPL 2.0 has a complete and corresponding source code wording that's more similar to the GPL and MPL 1.1.1 not. Uh, uh, also, well, and similar issue with GPL v2 to GPL v3. So there are packages out there that are widely used packages 
Um, and these are, this particular one is owned by the Free Software Foundation that was uh, originally written under GPLv2, but then switched license to GPLv3. And, uh, and it's not the packages themselves. You, you can go back and find those old versions of the packages, but uh, the interesting issue comes up with what about um, patches to that project? So for instance, there's a very interesting and useful patch to plug a security vulnerability in Bash called Shellshock. And the patch for that was submitted simultaneously by the same person or same organization to version 4.3 of, of Bash, which was GPLv3, and version 3.2 of Bash, which was GPLv2. So uh, what is the license of that patch? Well, I would say uh, it's, it's the license of the project it was contributed to, but it gets more complicated than that. So uh, you can envision uh, places where people are extracting patches from uh, versions of the software that have a different license and are they, you know, can they be accepted in backports? <clears throat> so there's a lot of factors to that. Um, that's something that you really need to look out for. Uh, so just be really, really careful in handling of any packages that are GPLv2 that you know have switched uh, to a different license. Um, and then there's another example. Uh, there are other examples where uh, it's not uh, it's not trivial to figure out the license for all of the uh, outputs from a package. So for instance, in Util Linux NG, uh, it's mostly GPLv2. And if you look at the copying file that's at the top of the, the source code directory, it says GPLv2. I think it may now say GPLv2 and some other stuff. Uh, but you have to go look at the uh, headers that are on individual files because there are a couple of files that are actually GPLv3. So you, it's, uh, you have to be paying attention and, and looking closely at this stuff uh, to make sure you don't get caught. Um, so uh, this, is, this is the part of the presentation well, I, I'll just, um, unlockability, in my opinion, is not required by GPLv2, but I think it's a topic that um, a lot of uh, companies, CE companies are interested in, and uh, there's a lot of discussion in the industry about it. So I'm gonna talk about it anyway, uh, at, at my own legal and reputational peril. Um, so you can have, there's a spectrum of unlockability, right? So you can have a fully unlocked product, a not unlockable product, which is a lockdown product, uh, put in more positive terms with a double negative, or you can have something that you can unlock and then reinstall the OSS only. So let me talk about those. Um, a fully unlocked product is something where, uh, okay, and uh, I'm talking about kind of a specific class of products that have uh, the ability to stream content and or, and or the ability to connect to a backend service. So I'm not talking about some little IoT device that doesn't have a whole bunch of other considerations that's like I got a 100% open source stack. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a, a product with a mixed stack uh, consisting of proprietary and open source software. So a fully unlocked product would mean uh, that, um, that you you can reinstall all of the software and retain all, all the keys and connect to the backend services. Okay, so first, this is not required by any open source license, including GPL v3. So open source licenses only cover software uh, that is open source. It doesn't cover the proprietary software or the, or the streaming keys or the backend keys. Those are not, those are not part of the open source. Um, and for some products, not for all of them, but for some products, it's simply not supportable as a business proposition. And so the example I'll give out here is video game consoles and network play. So if you can unlock the product and, and you can alter the operating system, um, then trust me, you can figure out a way to cheat in online gameplay. Uh, and uh, that's kind of the reason that people do this. Um, and so uh, that is an example of a product where it's, it, the, the ecosystem relies on there being uh, a protection of the capabilities of the individual nodes on the network or uh, to make it fair for other players. And so that's part of the reason people buy the software is when they do network play, they don't want people to be playing unfairly. Uh, so it's actually kind of baked into uh, the, the whole business model and, and what customers want. Uh, so a fully unlocked product, uh, I think is unrealistic. It only works in a world of perfect and honest actors. And that is unfortunately not the world we live in. So let's talk about the opposite end of the spectrum, which is, uh, most CE companies lock down the product and just don't look back. Uh, and so 
you can argue whether that's good or bad, but the security for this type of thing is often done in multiple layers. Uh, you've got encryption uh, for the update images themselves, the things that are transferred from the back end over the air to the, the product for updating. You've got uh, on the device, you've got trusted execution rings and uh, trusted protected modules uh, that are holding the secret keys and stuff. You've got encrypted file systems. Uh, and then you've got kernel module and application signing. So everything's verified before it starts. Um, so these products are really locked down hard uh, because uh, the industry has shown itself, well, uh, certain as sectors of the consumers of these products have shown, shown themselves to be uh, pretty agile at uh, breaking in and, uh, and doing stuff. Um, but there are counterexamples, right? So uh, I know that there are some Xperia phones uh, that are unlockable and some Google Pixel phones, not all of the phones, but some of them. Uh, so it is possible to, to do uh, some level of unlocking. You don't have to um, lock everything up. And uh, so this is a, a product I'm gonna describe here that allows you to unlock the product and reinstall only the open source software. Um, and a couple of notes about this. So this does give consumers the ability to modify, install modified open source software. Uh, while at the same time protects the uh, interests of the content industry and consumers who want to stream content. Uh, if you, if you uh, anyway, so there's no obligation to make proprietary software work with open source software. That's not in any license. Uh, and so what that means is uh, it may require the removal or disabling of proprietary software. Uh, what that ends up doing is, so the device, once you've unlocked it like this, you may lose quite a bit of functionality, depending on the stack. It, it's heavily dependent on what items are in your stack. Um, so uh, the customer, the bottom line is customer demand for this is very low. This is not your average consumer that's trying to, to break into their TV set or their phone or, or whatever, or their streaming device. Uh, because the customer demand is low, it's a very hard sell to your business unit. I, and so um, as there's just not enough, um, you know, customers to make it interesting uh, to do the uh, difficult engineering work involved. Uh, this can be a one-way action. Uh, that's most how, often how it's done is that once you unlock the product, you can't relock it again and get back those proprietary uh, software, those content keys. Uh, that is actually technically very, very difficult. Once you've removed the content keys, there are some places in those layers of security where, um, write once operations are performed. So you can only, you can't actually rewrite the, the encryption keys for some flash devices, for example. So, um, okay. So having said all that, uh, let me let me just dive into what I recommend. So this is kind of the summary wrap up portion here. Uh, these are the kind of main things that you need to think about um, and what I recommend you do. So first, in terms of communication, Please, please, please communicate with your upstream suppliers. Do it in advance. Don't do it as an afterthought. Uh, get your suppliers involved with OpenChain, the OpenChain project. Make sure they have processes in place. I, it is sad, but I'm aware of uh, several major vendors who have had what I call O-CRUD moments uh, where they found out a supplier uh, was not giving them the right stuff or was not giving them any stuff. And, and, uh, and that's a really... Uh, awkward and difficult situation for a vendor to get into. So some of the ideas I have are, uh, you can put penalties in place in your procurement contracts. Again, this is for kind of large suppliers who have uh, procurement contracts. Uh, for You can put penalties for failure to disclose open source software, or you can require permission um, in advance to deliver components with open source software. There's a couple of different ways to deal with that. Um, I think it's good if you can get a license manifest. Uh, that talks about all the files on your device uh, and try and get the license for every single file. Uh, again, don't do um, don't don't do this as an afterthought. Don't have this be during your QA of your product. You're assembling all this information. Try to get it up front. Um, another thing that you can try. Um, I don't think very many companies do this, um, and I'm not going to assert that Sony does it in all cases. Uh, but you can try to build what you get from your supplier. Uh, ask that your source be accompanied with a script that does a start to finish build. Um, and one of the things you find is that it, products have a lifetime. If product has a lifetime of five to 10 years, the build environment changes substantially over that time or what's the kind of the current distro. And so it becomes obsolete and very hard to reproduce. So I recommend a Docker file to capture things like the host OS, the tool chains and other programs. Um, 
And uh, if you have an internal team, if you can have another team besides that team kind of test out the build. Uh, this is highly aspirational. I'm not saying anybody does this now, but I think this would be a good thing for the industry to move towards. Um, and then in source availability, this is pretty obvious. Make an internet download site where people can obtain the source for your products. And uh, there are some uh, people who sometimes play games with only trying to allow just customers to get to it. Um, but it, I, don't, I don't see a reason for that. Just make the source code available to all. Um, and then you do need an offer for physical media. Uh, you won't get much traffic. You won't have to find yourself burning a lot of CDs, but uh, you should make sure you have one and that it works. Uh, in terms of unlockability, uh, in my view, unlocking your product is not required by GPL v2. Um, so, uh, but it does make community members and customers happy. Um, and so you may decide that you want to do that. There, there are good reasons to make an unlockable product. Uh, and so in the, independent of what your view is of the license requirements. If you support unlocking, uh, then if you handle backend services or streaming content, anything protected, you'll have to figure out a way to, to deal with that. And it's more difficult than it sounds. Um, if you don't support reinstallation, uh, you must uh, avoid GPL v3 software. That's my opinion. Uh, so uh, final statements. So first, I hope I haven't scared you with all this talk. It sounds like a lot of work and, and uh, there, are, there are some uh, I's to dot and T's to cross. Uh, but uh, it, it is possible. So people, people have been doing this for many years. Uh, compliance with the license is required. It's not like it's an optional thing. It's part, of, uh, it's part of the payment that you're making for the open source that you received. You've gotten an awful lot of value as a vendor uh, from open source software, from the developers who put time and effort into it, and uh, giving back to them uh, what they ask for is, uh, is appropriate. And, uh, and legal. Um, it's, it's not trivial, but it is achievable. And then I, again, I'm gonna make my disclaimer at the end here, due to legal uncertainty, um, make sure you make decisions uh, based on kind of knowledge of the risk and with your own company's uh, legal team. Uh, and then my last thing is a plug for the Open Chain Project. You really should check out the Open Chain Project. And uh, I have a little four leaf clover here on, on here, so uh, I hope that the information in this presentation has been useful to you and uh, that uh, you'll benefit from it and good luck in your compliance activities and I hope to see you around the industry. So with that, I will go ahead and take some questions.